Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Uh, today's a big day. It, it really is. Um, I was uh, thinking a few minutes ago about the fact of how we are having to worship on Easter Sunday this year in 2020. And um, we're not gathered together as a big family. Normally we'd fill up the place uh, three or four times on the weekend of Easter. And uh, we, we'd see eight or 10,000 people uh, gather together here in this building. Uh, and, and I just thought for a minute as the Holy Spirit kind of whispered to me, and he said to me, Mike, you're gonna preach to more people this Easter Sunday morning than you've ever preached to anyone at any given time. I, I remembered uh, uh, a few years ago in Greensboro, God privileged me to preach to 16,000 people and uh, we had 1,000 people to walk down the aisle and pray to receive Jesus that night. It was a powerful moment. But, but the Lord just whispered a few minutes ago and he said, Mike, you're gonna preach to more this Easter Sunday morning than you've ever preached. And I thought, that's an incredible thought. That's an incredible aspect, God, that you would grant me that privilege. Easter is a big deal. Today is a big deal. Uh, first thing I wanna do, I wanna wish my bride a very happy birthday today. Uh, she was born on April the 12th in 19... And today is her birthday. And uh, so I just want to say happy birthday to my bride. But I can tell you this. It's a, Easter is a big deal today uh, to me personally because 50 years ago today, God saved my old wretched soul. It's a big deal for me today. But... but if you want to broaden that a little bit, Easter's a big deal because really it's the, the greatest event that ever occurred in the history of mankind. As a matter of fact, it divides human history. Before Easter, B.C., before Christ, and then after the resurrection is A.D., in the year of our Lord, it's indicative of Easter Sunday when Jesus Christ overcame death, hell, and the grave. Easter is a big deal. Across the globe today, uh, there'll be over a billion people in some aspect will worship God. A billion people on Easter Sunday. Why is that? Why, why is Easter that big of a deal? Because it proved who Jesus said that he was. It proved who Jesus was. You know, Jesus made some stupendous claims while he was here. He said, I am God. He said, I and the Father are one. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he went on to say something like this. He said, one of these days, uh, I am going to allow you to take my life from me. I'm going to allow you to crucify me on a cross. I'm going to allow you to bury me in a borrowed grave. But I just want you to know that three days later, I will rise from the dead. Easter Sunday proves Jesus was who he said that he was and who he is today because he did come up out of that grave. He, he walked those old dusty roads of Palestine for a while and the people said, look who's here. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. My text today, and I hope you have a copy of the Word of God with you this morning, and uh, you'll turn over there with me to the uh, first Peter, if you will. And I want you to see with me the first chapter. And uh, I want you to notice verse number three. First uh, Peter chapter one and verse three. Listen to what the scripture says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has 
begotten us again into a lively hope. That's a powerful word. In other words, uh, because of who Jesus is, you and I have a great expectation. Now notice what he says. By the resurrection or because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I have an amazing life of hope because Jesus did what he said that he was going to do and did what he came to this earth to do. Now here's the beautiful part of it. And I love this part. And God has a very unique and he has a very distinct plan for every one of your lives. Now I know that some of you have a hard time swallowing that. But I can prove to you biblically that God loves you and God has a specific purpose and plan for your life. And here's the beautiful part about it is. He not only has a plan for you, he is going to enable you. He is going to grant you his power in order to accomplish the very plan that he has laid out for you. I only have a two-point sermon today. I had eight points a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, but today I only have two. That doesn't mean I'm going to finish any quicker. Uh, but I do have two wonderful thoughts that I want to leave with you today. Number one, it's this. We can know God's purpose. We can know God's plan for our life. Do you know that God never made anything that he didn't have a purpose in making it for? I, I, I read recently the, the creation story. And, and the word of God says that God said, let there be light. God had a purpose for light. And that was to dispel the darkness. He created the earth. And he had a marvelous plan in mind for the earth. He created the animals. And animals have a purpose uh, in this life. Uh, matter of fact, the fact that he made you indicates and proves that he has a plan just for your life, a purpose for you. Now, regardless of the circumstances of your birth, regardless of whether you're considered to be planned or unplanned, God has a purpose just for you, and that he made you. Regardless of how you got here, regardless, God took the genes from this one and the genes from another one, and he meshed those two genes together and he made you. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10, the Bible says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. In other words, God has a plan. God has a purpose uh, for your life, which God prepared in advance for you to do. In other words, long before you were ever born, God's design was that he would work through you and in you to accomplish a specific plan and purpose through your life. You are put here for a reason. You are put here for a purpose. God designed you before you were ever born. You were made by God and you were made for God. Now, hear my heart a minute. Until you grasp, grab hold of that, until you grasp that, uh, until you come to grips with the fact that you were made by God and for God, life is not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. you you're never going to really figure it all out. I, I thought about uh, Mary and Martha when their uh, brother Lazarus got sick. They sent for Jesus and uh, when the messengers arrived and the disciples heard what the dilemma was, Jesus said, you know, I'm not going to go down there right now. I know Lazarus is sick, uh, but uh, I'm not heading there right now. Uh, because if I go down there right now and I touch his body and I heal him, all that anybody's ever going to know about me is that I am a healer. And there's so much more about me that I want people to know and to realize that uh, uh, that, that I'm just a healer. So the Bible says that he didn't show up to Bethany until Lazarus was dead about four days and was stinking in the grave. Mary and Martha come running out and said, Lord, if you'd been here, our brother had not died. 
And uh, he said, well, you'll see your brother again. Oh, yeah, we know. We'll see him at the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus looked at them and said, you're looking at the resurrection. Show me the place where you laid him. And he went out and he called Lazarus by name. And Lazarus came walking out of that grave. And now all of a sudden, the plan and the purpose of the Lord Jesus was made clear. And they understood why that he delayed his coming. Is that he wanted to show that he had power over death itself. And, and you understand something. None of that made sense to Mary and Martha because Jesus was not there. But when Jesus showed up, it all made sense. Understand something. Your life is never going to make sense without God. Not going to make sense until you know him. If there's no God to you, then you're nothing more than a freak, an accident of nature. Uh, your life really, <laughs> if there is no God, your life doesn't really matter, then does it? Life then becomes just worthless. A drive-by shooter comes along, takes your life. People would say, well, you know what? That's just too bad, isn't it? But the Bible says that God knew you before you were born. And when you were born, you were born with this God-shaped vacuum, this heart-shaped vacuum in your life that only a relationship with the God of this universe will ever be able to fit and to fill up. Now, a lot of people try to fill up that shape and they try to fill up that void with a lot of stuff. Many of them try to fill it up and I'm watching, I'm watching people do this even before my eyes and, and, and all of a sudden during this pandemic that we're in, we're watching people begin to question, wait a minute, did I do the right thing? When they started filling up their life with passions, trying to fill up that void with possessions and stuff and things and now all of a sudden people are realizing, you know what? That hasn't done for me what I thought it was going to do. A, a lot of people want to fill up that void with pleasure. And so they mm, sit out and travel all over the world. And, and they want to wind up getting high off different things, trying to figure out that if I can just make myself happy and I can just enjoy the pleasures of this world. But they discover that it doesn't fit. They try to fill it up with relationships. I, I watch men and women get married thinking that my spouse is going to be the one that is really going to bring me real contentment. That spouse is going to provide uh, for the much need that is in my heart and in my life. And, and it just doesn't work. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, I'm watching husbands and wives break up in their marriage because that husband didn't fill up that void. That wife didn't fill up that void. Well, there's a reason behind that. Men and women weren't designed to fill the void up in our heart and our life. It's a hole that only God can fill up in our life. And I'm watching this too. Listen to this. I'm watching people pretend to be a lot happier than what they really are. I'm watching people as they are pretending to be more content in life than they really are. Um, unfortunately, right now, our restaurants are closed and many of these happy hour joints, but I watched them before they closed, and, and I watched the people that went to happy hour. You know what I found out? There's, there's some of the most unhappy, disillusioned people that I've ever met in my life, and they're pretending. You look at their face, and they got a smile on their face, but there's a hole in their heart that they're pretending is filled up. But the fact of the matter is, it's really not. I'm watching people uh, have pretense about their marriage and their relationship with their husband and their wife. And uh, then all of a sudden, a little crack uh, gets into the midst of that pretense and all of a sudden feelings begin to surface uh, and come to light that they had been shoved down and pretended that they weren't really there 
when you watch despair and discouragement and disillusionment and dissatisfaction because they don't want to admit that life has not turned out the way that they thought that it was going to. Maybe that's you. People that are engaged in a lot of activity, but they don't have any direction in their life. May I say to all of you that are here this morning, listen, you were made to know God. And that's his purpose for you in this life. Jeremiah chapter 29 I've quoted it several times just recently. In verse number 11, he says that I have plans for you, not to harm you or to hurt you, uh, but I have good plans in mind for your life that is going to bring you joy and fulfillment and contentment and bring you to a desired place that I have prepared just for you. May, may I say to everybody today, God, God, God can make you happier than anything or anyone. God has a unique plan just for your life. The problem is this. We think that we know better than God does what's best for our life. And so when God says to us, I have a plan for your life, we say, well, well thank you, God, but uh, really I'm too busy right now accomplishing my own goals and achieving my own desires and, and getting to my own ambitions uh, that are in life. I've got my own plans, but ultimately, when we go in our own direction, apart from what God has in store for us, our problems then get bigger and bigger in our life. The reason being is that we're going against the grain, and when we're going against the grain, it, it, things just don't fit because they're not doing what we were made to do. Back in the early 1970s, uh, I worked at uh, a retail store called Sears. Um, I started out in the um, advertising department and uh, spent a couple of years there, but then I, I moved out into the hardware department. And I worked in the hardware department for about six months. And if you've ever shopped at Sears, uh, man, they had a return policy that was unbelievable in that hardware department. So if it was broken, all you had to do was to bring it back and they would exchange it and give you a brand new one. And, and, and they would always say, remember, Mike, the customer is always right. And so I'd worked out there for about six months and I watched people bring back screwdrivers that were broken in two. I watched them as they would bring a screwdriver and it would be bent in the shape of a horseshoe. And I'd look at them dead in their eye and I'd kind of scratch my head a little bit and I said, now wait a minute. Uh, did you do that by using it as a screwdriver or as a, 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 some kind of lever to wedge something out? Did you use it as a crowbar maybe instead of, oh no, I, I used it for a screwdriver. Well, let, let me just say to you, uh, when we start living our lives other than for what it is planned to be, you can expect stress to happen. You can expect us to be warped. You, you can expect us to bend and to break uh, in two. Now you say, well, Mike, how do I discover the purpose in life? Well, you got about three alternatives that you can choose. Uh, you can consult a human expert if you want to and ask them about the purpose in life. You can go to Jimmy Fallon on one of the late night shows or you can ask him. You, you might try Oprah Winfrey and by all means, uh, go to Jerry Springer. He, he knows all about human behavior and just find out maybe a little bit about what kind of, what kind of advice you're going to get from there. The, the other is, is that you may listen to the movies and you may read the books off the self-help shelf and, and, and inevitably you're going to hear the message, look deep inside. Just look inside your own self. You can discover your purpose and plan by just looking. You know what, I've tried that. I really have. Uh, when I'm faced with difficult situations and I'm faced with maybe some impossibilities in life, I've had the tendency in my life to look down inside and just say, okay, Mike, 
Uh, you have the solution inside. You can do this. You know what I found out when I looked down in my own heart and life? I found a whole lot more problems. I found out a whole lot more junk. When I looked inside, I didn't find the solutions to the problems that I was facing. I found more problems to have to deal with. The other place that you can look is that you can look to God and to God only. The creator of who we really are. The, the one who wrote the owner's manual, if you will. You're going to find a much more reliable place to discover your purpose and his plan for your life. It is there that you will discover who you are and you will discover whose you are. Two very important discoveries that you were made by God and you were made for God. And until you come to that place in life, life is never going to make much sense to any of you. Now let me give you the second one. You need God's power to live on. You not only need God's purpose and plan, you need God's power to carry that plan out. Hey, uh, man, especially in today's world, I don't have to tell you how tough life really is. I don't have to tell you how difficult things can get. I don't, I don't have to tell you how hard that situations come our ways to face. It's tough. And, and, and the deal is, we don't have a button somewhere in our life to mash that just puts us coasting. There, there is no uh, autopilot, if you will, uh, that we have in our life. It takes energy. It takes stamina. Uh, it takes effort. And it takes power. Now, you understand, when you have a purpose in your life, it takes power to run that purpose. Now, think back with me for just a minute when you were a baby. You know, you learned some things very early on as a little tiny baby. Here's one of the things you learned. You learned that if I whimper just a little bit, if I cry just a little bit, if I scream, if I yell as a baby, I can get about anything that I want. And you learned that if you cried a little bit, you could be fed. If you cried a little bit more, you could be changed. If you cried a little bit more, you could be coddled. If you cried a little bit more, you could be rocked and just made uh, over. But here's the deal. Uh, you started getting older. And, and as you got older, things changed. And one of the things that changed is, is that the world got to be a much more difficult place to live. And you discovered that uh, as you got older and as you matured, you realized that life really could get out of control pretty easily. And then you cried and you cried and the adults didn't come running like they did when you were a baby. And life got difficult. Now, do, do you understand you grew up and you matured and you found out that life could get really out of control? Have you ever, you ever realized how much of life really is out of your control? You know what wears me out? You know what exhausts me? You know what drains me emotionally and spiritually? And physically in this life is the ridiculousness of trying to control the uncontrollable. I'm watching a lot of people do that right now. Trying to control the uncontrollable. I'm hearing them say, but I'm worn out. 
I'm played out. I'm stressed out. I'm bummed out. I'm run down. I'm used up. I'm bushed. I'm exhausted. I'm frazzled. I'm bone weary. I'm dead tired. I'm dead on my feet. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm about to come unglued here. and, and, And I am ready to throw in the towel. I'm hearing that. Could it be? Listen to this question. Could it be that God has allowed so much to happen in these days so that you and I would get to the point that we would learn to depend on him rather than trying to control stuff ourselves? Could it be that in these days of uncertainty that God is just using these days to get us to the point that we could learn to trust him, to lean on him, to rely upon him because he has all of the power that you and I will ever need in this life to carry out the purpose that is before us. He he demonstrated that time and time and time again. My word, just go read the scriptures. It's the power of God that was demonstrated through Jesus when he healed the sick, showing us that he had power over illness he had the power over nature itself when he calmed the waves and he stilled the winds he showed us that he had even power over death when he raised the dead and then ultimately he raised his own life from the dead with the power of God now here's something that I want you to know In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, the Bible says that the same power that did all of that stuff can bring you and your life into a right relationship with God that will never go away. That's God's promise to you. You understand today, this Easter in 2020, God is offering you this morning the power to change your life. You've tried to change it enough, but been very unsuccessful. But God is saying to you this Easter Sunday, I'll give you the power to change. I can demonstrate that for you. I can give you the power to let go of things that you've never been able to let go of. I can give you the power to let go of the grief that has been so real that has overshadowed your life I can give you the power to offer and extend forgiveness when you have not been able to forgive I can give you the power to start your life all over again the life that you have made such a mess of I can give you the power to lift you out of that spirit of discouragement and despondency and depression I can give you the power to become what you have always meant to be. I want you to look at some promises with me for a minute that God offers to you. God says to you and me, you can do all things through Christ who will give you the strength. God's word says in Colossians 1.11, God will strengthen you with his own great power so that you will not give up when troubles come. God's word says in Isaiah 40 in verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and grow, not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. In Isaiah 41, 10, he says, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. It's no wonder you're worn out. It's no wonder you're exhausted. It's no wonder that you are powerless. You've been trying to do everything in your own way, by your own terms, in your own strength, and now you've got nothing left. You say, well, preacher, how in the world do I get that power? There's only one way. There's not a bunch of ways. There's only one way, and that is through a personal, intimate, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Church, listen. That is what Easter is all about. I encounter people all of the time that know about God, but they don't know God. I encounter, and maybe you're one of those people. Maybe, you're, maybe there are many of you that are here and listening to this message today. And you went to Sunday school, and you took Awanas, and you studied the Bible, and you learned so much, and you know about God, but you don't know God. Uh, you, you've been to all of the classes, and maybe you'd say if you were truthful with God, I don't know him. If you're really truthful, you'd have to say, I don't have a relationship with God. Can, can I say to you today, God wants you to know him. God wants a relationship with you, and he wants you to know that he has a purpose and he has a plan in mind for your life that will give you tremendous significance and meaning. Now understand, once you have a personal intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you then will have all of the power that you will ever need to fulfill God's purpose and plan just for you. I reread some statistics in the last few days about my favorite movie. Uh, well, I don't know that it's my favorite movie, but it's one that I've seen a couple of times, three times, something like that, in the Titanic. I don't know how many of you ever watched it. It cost about $200 million at that time to produce. Uh, it, it right now has grossed over $2 billion in revenue. But it's a film, it's a, it's a film that has a, a class conflict about it. Uh, you see in that film, it is the rich versus the poor. It's the educated versus the uneducated. Uh, it's the famous versus the uh, not so famous people in there. Uh, and when the Titanic went down and the news accounts went all over America, there were two columns in every newspaper and they had the heading in those newspapers, those who are known to be lost and those who are known to be saved. And they listed those names in those columns. You, you understand that when the Titanic went down, it was no longer about how much education you had. It was no longer about your popularity. It was no longer uh, about what kind of uh, class that you were on in this life. All that mattered when the Titanic went down was were you saved or were you lost? Uh, I, I think about James Cameron who produced the movie. He made this statement. He said the Titanic is a metaphor of the inevitability of death. We are all on the Titanic. We've been watching all of the statistics about the pandemic and, you know, what the mortality rate is and all of that stuff. You know, the last time that I checked the mortality rate in America, you ready for this? One out of every one die. All will die. 100% of the people that are on this planet right now, if they live long enough, are going to die. When somebody comes to give me the condition of a friend of theirs or maybe a church member and they say the word, uh, well, pastor, I hate to tell you, but they are terminal. I look back at them and I say, you know what? We're all terminal. We're all going to die. And it is only the foolish who will go through life unprepared for something that they know is inevitable. And that it's going to happen. One day, ladies and gentlemen, we will stand before God. And God is going to ask the question. Did you receive my son as your Lord and as your Savior? Did you accept him into your heart and into your life? He's not going to ask you how rich you were. Not going to ask you how poor. 
He's not going to ask you how educated or uneducated. The question is going to be, what did you do with my son Jesus? Did you accept him or did you reject him? That's why Easter is so important. You were made by God. You were made for God. He loves you. He has seen every day of your life. And the fact of the matter is, he still loves you. And the Lord Jesus came into this earth to demonstrate to us what God looks like. And he wants you to learn, beginning today on this Easter Sunday, he wants you to begin to trust him. Trust is earned. How do you trust somebody that you have never seen? How do you trust God? Well, you learn about him. You, you, you get to know him. You say, how do, how do I get to know him? You come to the place in your life that you open up your life and you open up your heart and you open up your mind to him and you just cry out to him from the very depths of your life, oh God, I want to know you. I am convinced as the Holy Spirit kind of dealt with me earlier on, not only probably am I preaching to the largest number of people that I've ever preached to in my life, I am convinced that every problem known to mankind is right now represented by the audience of First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. I am convinced that there are Dozens and dozens of marriages that are listening to this sermon today that are really struggling in your relationship. There may be dozens and dozens of you that are already separated from your spouse and it, unless a miracle takes place, you're headed to the divorce courts. I uh, suspect with all of my heart that there are Many of you who have just buried a loved one and the burden of grief is so strong in your heart and your life, you're just wondering how in the world can I carry on like this? Some of you have some kids that have just become prodigals. They're not living for God. And they're breaking your heart by every move that they're making. I suspect that there are some of you that are unmarried you're crying out to God, God, I don't, I, don't, I don't like this loneliness that I'm struggling with right now. And I, I don't know what you have in store for me in the future. But, but God, I, I don't, I don't want to be alone anymore. I suspect, too, that finances are beginning to take a toll on many of your lives. Some of you are really struggling with some health issues. And you're worried, you know, what does the future hold for you? You may be asking the question, well, what's going to happen to my career? You may be asking, where am I going to go to school next year? What, what's going to happen to my education? Some of you are here in your living rooms, your cars, and you're just hiding as best as you know how from the shame of some past experiences. I'm convinced with all of my heart that this pandemic um, is a tool in the hands of God right now. That in all probability, you would have never sat in a building to hear this sermon. And because of the circumstances of our day, you are now sitting in front of a computer screen and you're listening to this sermon. It's not accidental. God brought you to that place. We're here on Easter Sunday morning and God's trying his best to get your attention long enough to say to you, you matter to me. I love you. I see everything that you're going through. I feel every hurt and every pain that is stabbing you in your heart. I see the ache 
in your heart. I know the pressure that you are facing and that you are under right now. And God is saying, you know what? I care about all of it. I love you, God says. If you don't hear anything else I've said today, I want you to hear this. God has a purpose and a plan and a power for you that is greater than any problem that you will ever have in your life. And all you've got to do is open up your heart to him. Cry out to him. And just say, Lord Jesus, I need your help. And he'll help you. So why don't you do it this Easter? I want to pray for you right now. So would every head be bowed and every eye closed for just a few minutes? Every head bowed. Every eye closed. I, I believe the Holy Spirit of God is so real and so active right now in your heart and in your life. And you've had it your way long enough. And I'm going to ask you right where you are to cry out to God. And I'll help you do that. Would you pray something like this and really mean it with all of your heart? God, I do want to know you. God, I do believe that you have a purpose and plan for my life. And yet, God, I know that my sin has kept me from knowing you and experiencing you. And I know that you went to that cross and you took my place on that cross. You paid my sin debt on that cross. So God, I'm calling out to you right now. Please forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart and into my life. And God, with your help and with your presence in my life, I'll live for you the remaining days of my life. Thank you, God, for hearing me pray. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me. Would you look this way just a minute? You know, God's not a liar. And he says, if you'll confess your sins and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, he said you would be saved. You've got God's word on that. You've got God's promise on that. He said, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord which you did just a minute ago. He said, thou shalt be saved. That's God's word to you this Easter. Right on your screen, down at the bottom underneath the video is a little tab that's down there that says, I prayed to receive Christ. Would you just hit that tab for me right now? Just go to it right now and hit that tab. And then uh, it'll take you to a place that asks for some more information. And, and listen, I not only wanted you to come to the place that you received Jesus, I want to help you in your next step. Please take some time today, right now, before you turn your computer off. Would you just fill out that little form for me and send it in? God will bless you for that. We care about you. And we love you. And we want to help you realize God's purpose and plan. I want to say thank you for joining us this Easter.
God bless you greatly is our prayer. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.